to rescue there are souls to save send the light send the light send the light the blessed gospel light let it shine from shore to shore send the light the blessed gospel light let it shine forevermore let us not grow weary in the work Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown of love. Send the light, oh, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified Really forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing glorious Savior. Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Sorrow be 
bless your name. Oh, the wonderful cross. The wonderful cross. Oh, the wonderful cross. Bids me come and die and find that I may truly is risen from the dead we are one with him again come away come away come and rise up from the grave christ is risen from the dead trembling over death by death come away come away come and rise up from the grave christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again come away come away is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the Thank you so much. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 11, please. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. The title of the message today is Challenging Faith. All of us know of Charles Barkley. He is now 50 years old. It's kind of hard for me to think about that Charles Barkley is 50 years old, but he is. Sir Charles, as he is often called, is an NBA legend right alongside the likes of Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson. He is a a legendary basketball player. One thing memorable about Barkley was his desire not to be watched too closely. He didn't like that. Oftentimes people were disappointed with his actions and his attitudes on and off the court, and they challenged him to be a better role model. Some of you may remember uh, his response to that. He said, hey, I'm a basketball player. I didn't ask to be anyone's role model, and I don't need that added responsibility. He didn't want the the challenge of being a role model, but as an NBA star, he really didn't have an option to choose whether or not he wanted to be a role model. That decision was made when he signed a contract to play professional basketball. That's just the way that it works. That's the way that life works. One of the challenges of the Christian life is that of being a role model. Like it or not, once we make a decision to follow Christ, people are watching us. And whether we want it or not, or whether we think it's fair, we become an example of the family of God, in the family of God, and to the family of God. There are times when our faith challenges us in ways that we did not expect, and people are watching when we are challenged in those ways. This morning, we're going to see four challenges of faith, one being the challenge of faith itself. For those of you who are just coming in for the first time into this series, this is a seven-part series called Finding Your Faith. And the reason for this series is because I believe that while born-again believers certainly have the faith to believe, and I believe that born-again believers, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, you're certainly going to heaven. But that being said, I, I fear that oftentimes what happens is that we lose our faith along the way. We are not as strong in our faith. And so I'm hoping that in some area during the course of this series, you'll find some faith that has leaked out along the way. Verse 4 of Hebrews 11, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was 
commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken, taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now for the remaining weeks of this series, all of our text will come from Hebrews chapter 11. The first example of faith, of a faith uh, that was challenged, is the faith of the second son of the first two people who ever lived, the faith of Abel. And his challenge was a challenge of sacrifice. Let's go back and read the first verse that we read. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Now, I think we need a little more understanding in order for us to appreciate uh, this verse. Here's something that has been true ever since the original sin of Adam. This is, this is key to why God accepted the sacrifice of Abel and did not accept the sacrifice of Cain. Hebrews 9 and verse 22. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now that is a key understanding for all of us who are born again believers. We must understand that the shedding of blood is necessary for the covering or the forgiveness of our sin. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins as an innocent lamb offered for the sins of the whole world. When we have communion, I was thinking about communion this morning. When we have communion, we offer the cup as a representation of the blood of Jesus Christ because we understand that the value of the blood is the sacrifice that it makes. Now that being said, as with other matters, this is something that we could expound upon, but the principle is enough for us to appreciate. This truth is the reason that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Once Adam and Eve lost their innocence in the Garden of Eden, God sacrificed an animal <clears throat> to make a covering for their sin. Do you remember that? That God gave them uh, a covering of coats of skin. And God made that for them. How did the covering for the coats of skin come? Well, animals were sacrificed. <clears throat> that was the blood sacrifice to cover the sin. They realized that they were in sin. They, they were no longer innocent. And they realized <clears throat> that they were naked. And uh, there's a lot of stories, I guess you could make of that. But they realized that they were naked. And when they did so, they were ashamed. And so as a covering for their sin, an animal was sacrificed and they were given a coating or a coat of skin. <clears throat> that animal would not have been killed had it not been for the sins of man. So the precedent was set as far back as the Garden of Eden. Now you understand a little bit more, or maybe you will understand a little bit more from these verses in Genesis chapter 4. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain, <clears throat> his offering, uh, for Cain's offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry <clears throat> and his face fell. Now this is a compelling story. I think most of you know it. But first of all, let's break it down in regard 
to the matter of faith. This is the challenge of sacrifice. So first there was the sacrifice. Sacrifice is a word that is often said, but it is not really understood. A sacrifice is an offering of something that cannot be or is not easily recovered. Then you have made a sacrifice. When we make a sacrifice for something, we offer up that which has been ours, and in the giving of it, we will not find it easy to get it back if we're able to get it back at all. We do so for the good or the glory of the one receiving our sacrifice. Now, a lot of people think they're sacrificing when they're not sacrificing. For instance, this is just a silly thing, but to trade in your car, one that you really loved, for a better one is not a sacrifice. That's just the trading of a car. Now, to give your car to someone who really needs it more than you, and you don't really have the money to replace it, that is a sacrifice. A sacrifice is when you knowingly and sacrificially and genuinely give something that you know you can't recover. I was thinking this morning about Farmer Brown and Farmer Jones. And Farmer Brown said to Farmer Jones, said, my friend, how close of friends are we? And Farmer Jones said, well, we're very close friends. We've always been close friends. Are we close enough that if you had two Cadillacs, you'd give me one of your Cadillacs? He said, well, you know that we're close enough for uh, to give, uh, that I'd give you one of my Cadillacs. Of course. And said Father, Farmer Brown, I think this is the one that's doing the talking to Farmer Jones. He said, if you had $2 million, would you give me $1 million of your $2 million? <clears throat> and Farmer Jones said, of course, you know that I would do that. I'd be very happy to give you one million of my two million dollars. And he said, well, let me ask this. If you had two hogs, would you give me one of your hogs? And Farmer Brown said, you know I got two hogs. <laughs> That's kind of the way we look at sacrifice. If it's out of the realm of possibility, we say, well, of course we would do that. <clears throat> or if, if it's easily replaced, we say, well, sure, we'll do that. But if it's a real sacrifice, we're real careful about it. What was the difference between Cain's sacrifice and Abel's sacrifice? Well, Cain <clears throat> gave a basket of vegetables from his garden. He had picked them that morning. You say, well, wasn't that a nice sacrifice? Yes, however, the next morning <clears throat> there would be more vegetables. In fact, he may have had his eye on other vegetables that would be <clears throat> even nicer in a day or two. And so it wasn't a real sacrifice. It was just something that he got out of the garden. Abel not only offered a blood sacrifice, which was pleasing to God, but he offered the first and the best that he had to offer. The book of Samuel, Samuel says <clears throat> that to obey is better than sacrifice, and Abel was both sacrificial and obedient. Abel made an obedient <clears throat> sacrifice to the Lord. It's a challenge uh, of faith to be obedient to God. It's a challenge of faith <clears throat> to sacrifice to God. If you look at your life and you were very honest about, let's say how you sacrifice for the Lord, <clears throat> you were very honest about it, here's the question. Would your sacrifice reveal more <clears throat> the sacrifice of Abel, who gave the first and the best and not easily replaced? Or <clears throat> would it represent the sacrifice of Cain, who gave out of the garden and was going to go back to the garden and pick a basket full again the next day? <clears throat> what would your sacrifice most likely resemble? Which would your sacrifice most likely resemble? Well, the challenge of sacrifice is, first of all, the sacrifice, to actually make a sacrifice, to actually give uh, beyond what is easily replaced, to offer beyond what is easily recoverable. Oftentimes with the sacrifice, there's some scorn 
that is involved. People may scorn you for your sacrifice. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Now, if you don't know the rest of the story, let me just tell you real quickly. <clears throat> Cain went on, and he killed his brother Abel, and then he lied to God about it. He killed Abel, he hid his body, and then he lied to God. His punishment <clears throat> was a life sentence of hard labor. All of this because he scorned the sacrifice of faith that his brother gave to the Lord. If we truly walk in faith, there is always the risk of scorn. Look at how the leaders of Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby have been held up to ridicule because of their stand. Both the, the leaders of both of these companies have taken a stand for traditional marriage. They have taken a, a stand for family. They have taken a stand for the right to life. Both of these, and I'm sure there are many, many others, but, but Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby <coughs> come to, to mind. Based on their faith, they have taken stands that place them in jeopardy, in jeopardy with the government. It brought on to them negative publicity, depending on the, the point of view that someone is looking at what they've done. And <coughs> I'm sure it has caused them a lot of internal conflict, not only within themselves, but within their companies. But that's the way that it's going to be if you make a, a believer's sacrifice. <clears throat> There's going to be people who will not understand. They will not appreciate why you do what you do or are doing what you're doing. <clears throat> a walk in faith will have goals different from a walk in the world. A walk in faith will set standards of life that the world around it doesn't understand and, and doesn't appreciate. A walk in faith will have goals different from the walk of the world. It'll set standards of life <clears throat> that the world around it may not understand and may not appreciate. A walk of faith will make decisions that the world thinks to be crazy. Th there will definitely be some scorn involved in a walk in faith. Then why would you want to walk in faith? Why would you want to do that? It's because of the satisfaction. There is satisfaction in the challenge of sacrifice. <clears throat> the satisfaction is in knowing that we have pleased the Lord. Abel died in faith knowing that he had pleased the Lord. Now, I'm not eager to die for my faith, but a faith worth living for is a faith worth dying for. In Abel's case, he died because of the jealousy of the world. He died because the world, or his brother, representing the world, was jealous of his walk with God. The vapor of Abel's life was shorter than the vapor of many others, but it was met with the satisfaction of a well done by the Heavenly Father. I was talking to Mike Ramage earlier. Mike, in, in his dash, there was, a, there was a lot that was done in that short dash of, of his life. I can't tell you how you should sacrifice. I can't get inside of you and know what's a sacrifice for you. But I can tell you this, that God is pleased when someone by faith sacrifices an obedient sacrifice to him. I would, I would much rather walk in the pleasure of God than the displeasure of God. I would much rather walk in the pleasure of God knowing that I had pleased him than to be in displeasure knowing that there was something that I didn't do that I should have done in trying to please him. So first of all, there is the challenge of sacrifice. That challenge is best described or best illustrated by Abel. Secondly, there is the challenge of consistency or being consistent, consistency. We come to a man named Enoch, Hebrews 11 and verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. By the way, I saw something in that verse that I'd never seen before. Uh, the Bible says that he was not found. Do you know what that means? People are out looking for him. 
uh, they, Enoch vanished and people were out looking for him and he was never found. The mystery is solved here in Hebrews 11. Now we don't know a lot about Enoch. We know that, that after Cain was judged by the Lord that he and his wife had a son named Enoch, but that's not the same Enoch. I'm not sure what became of him, but in the further lineage of Adam, there was another Enoch who was born to a man named Jared. And uh, this, this man, uh, Dr. Maxwell, his name was, was Jared, very much like uh, your son, uh, you and Kathy, your son's name is Jared. Now this Enoch was born to a man named Jared, and he became a father of many children. One of the children of Enoch was the man who lived longer than anyone else recorded in the Bible, Methuselah. He was the son of uh, Enoch. Methuselah was the son of Enoch. Methuselah lived, by the way, <clears throat> to be 969 years old. Enoch, however, didn't die at all. He lived <clears throat> for 365 years, and then he vanished. He was gone. <clears throat> what happened to him? Genesis 5:23. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, he was not, for God took him. Now the word there, he was not, the words he was not, means he was not allowed to die. He walked in faith for a very long time, which presented a challenge of its own. There is a challenge in living a long time, especially a challenge to our faith. And that challenge to our faith is that we live consistently. Look, here is what we can take from these words about Enoch's faith. First of all, let's talk a little bit about long life. Enoch lived a long, long time. Now, the length of life has changed over the years. Today, it seems like people are starting to live a little bit longer again. Don't you agree with that? I, I think they're living a little longer on the average than, than in the past. Um, certainly, the past like 50 years ago, they were not living as long as they are today. The longer that we lived and the more our faith is, the more our faith is challenged. In our younger life, in our younger years, life is an adventure. We are very adventurous. As we grow older, we tend to want the more routine, the less adventurous. I have a favorite place in this whole world to sit. Do you know where that is? It's in a big leather recliner that's probably 10 or 12 years old, sitting right in the middle of our family room. I love to sit in that chair. If I'm at the house all by myself and I go someplace to have a seat, I will go to that chair. I get very comfortable in that chair. You know the problem with that? The problem with that is we can become comfortable in way too many areas of life by that, by that kind of, of thinking, including our faith. The walk of faith in our old age becomes uh, a walk more of more established paths and <clears throat> with an appetite for not wanting to stretch our faith. We don't want to add too much to our faith. We don't want to put our faith under <clears throat> any kind of pressure. And so we become very familiar with our walk, and we want the walk. And, and could I say this? And I say this lovingly, but that's why oftentimes from older people you hear these words. We've never done it that way before. Now the reason for that is because they're comfortable in their paths. Everybody gets comfortable in their path. Uh, if you're asking for or expecting long life from God and you want to ask for that, that's fine, but ask for more than that. Ask that you be allowed to continue your walk in faith and not become so set in your ways that your faith gets rust on it. It's one of the reasons for this, mess, this series of messages is I honestly believe that a lot of us have rusted up in our faith. And, and could I say this to you, that that many people are so discouraged, Christian people 
are so discouraged over the condition of the world, the, the, what's going on in, in the economy, what's going on in, in Congress, what's going on with morality, that so many Christian people have become discouraged to the point that they have this thing going on that says, well, what's the use? And our faith has rusted up. I want to say something to you, regardless of where you stand on the political spectrum, on the conservative to liberal spectrum, spectrum, whatever it may be, what, regardless of where you stand, regardless of who is the president, who's not the president, regardless of what your job situation is and what your job situation may not be, regardless of your health care situation, regardless of gay marriage, regardless of the abortion situation, regardless of any of that, regardless of any of that, your God is still on the throne. Don't shy away from your faith because it, got, it gets rust on it. Don't let your faith rust up. The same God who saved you and has kept you saved for all these years will keep you throughout the remainder of your years and you can serve him and you can walk in faith. And if you want to live a long time, and I hope you live a long, long time, but let me say this to you. I hope that when you die that your faith is in perfect working order and has not one bit of rust or corrosion on it. You want long life? Then also ask God for it to be a long life well lived. <clears throat> Enoch lived a very long time and he maintained an active faith. He pleased God so much that every step that he took, he drew closer to God until one day he stepped into the presence of God, right into the presence of God. That adds a, a new twist on a familiar verse to me. And that is James chapter 4 and verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Here's the way our last days ought to be. Our last days ought to be that final step. We've been walking closer and closer to the Lord until we get to that final step. And we take that final step and we've stepped into the presence of God. Last Monday. We have a housekeeper that works on staff. She, she takes care of the house of God right here. She vacuums, she cleans. Wonderful lady. She and her mother <clears throat> take care of the house of God. They do. Her mother's name is Emma, and the daughter's name is Gwen. <clears throat> Last Monday, uh, and by the way, Gwen, lots of fun. Emma, I just love them both. <clears throat> Last Monday, Gwen came to work, and she worked a full day. Mrs. Ray saw her riding across the parking lot on, on one of the gators. I don't know if somebody's giving her a ride, but, but <clears throat> Mrs. Ray remembers her driving across the parking lot and, and riding across on one of the gators. She went home to her family, and her family was gathered around. They were sitting outside. It was a nice afternoon to sit outside, and, and uh, she was having a little trouble breathing, and she told somebody to go get her, her daughter, Ebony, and they went to get her daughter, Ebony, and when Ebony got out there, Emma was taking her last breaths, and she looked up at her son, and she said, I love you, I'm out. <laughs> now see, that's a way to go right there. That's a way to go. Do I think she was too young to go? Way too young to go. 52 years old, way too young to go. But I'd love to be able to end it by just taking that last step of faith and step right into the presence of God. I'd love that. I really would. I'm not against extraordinary measures to try and help people to extend their life and so on, and, and, but, but I think that there's, a, there's a, a, a lot of that has taken from people what I think that Gwen experienced, and Gwen experienced to step into the presence of God. 
more than one person has said to me and, and others that they want to finish well. Finishing well is a challenge of faith because faith is a challenge. There's a challenge of sacrifice. There's a challenge of consistency. And then there's the challenge of individuality. Faith is going to make you an individual. It's going to make you a challenging individual, and you're going to be challenged as being an individual. Here's a good example of that. Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet, not, uh, as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Well, here's the third in our story of text. It's the story of Noah. The life and calling of Noah shows us what it can be if you're the only one standing in faith. Let's refresh our memory a little bit. The time of Noah was a time when the earth was so wicked that God <clears throat> felt that he needed to just destroy mankind with the exception of one man and his family, and he would let them start afresh and anew. That's how bad the earth was. He continued to serve God, even though literally the rest of the world would not serve God. That is Noah. He was <clears throat> one individual of faith in a world of faithlessness. In fact, in a world of wickedness, in a world of just pure old nasty sin. And that's what, who he was. And that's what we call taking a stand when that's who you are. You're taking a stand. Now, I want to give you three things about we can take from the faith of Noah. First of all, for each of us, there's a different reality. We're not all in the same set of circumstances. While all of us must live our lives in the real world, our realities are not all the same. What's real for me in my life every day is much different than what's real for you. If I shadowed you for a day and I walked every place that you go for a day and I heard every day what you hear and I, I responded every day to what you had to respond to, or if you did the same with me or if any of us did for the others, we'd find out that our realities are much, much different different. They're just different. We have a, a different calling of life. We have a different state of life. We're not all at the same place as far as the everyday circumstances of life. We live the lives that God has given us, not the life that God has given to someone else. You ever said this? Well, it's easy for them to do thus and so because they have or they are this. That's, I mean, I, I love you, but that's an ignorant statement. Everybody has their own reality. Everybody faces their own challenge. All of us do. I mean, we are absolutely within our own challenge. Whenever we make an observation of how someone else has acted or handled a situation or perform, performed in life, remember that your life and calling is much different than theirs. Much different than theirs. Well, I don't think they should have done that. Or if it were me, this is what I would have done. And oftentimes we say that, but we have no idea what we have done because our life and calling is in a different state. It's in a different place. Like it was for Noah, God has a, a will for your life and for my life, and it's an individual will. He has a way that he wants us to live and to, to do our work. Now, we all have the Bible. We all have the Word of God. But <clears throat> beyond that, God has a path for us. And the challenge of our individuality is that we have different realities. We do. We have different realities in every level of life. Here's the second thing. It could be that we have a dubious reputation depending on our realities. Jesus spoke in the, of this unique blessing in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. I'm sure that Noah had a world full of detractors. After all, it was just he and his family, and they were doing something that had ever never been done before they were building 
an ark, and, and they were predicting something that had never happened before, and that was rain. And not only were they predicting that, they were predicting a flood. What are you doing? I'm building this ark. Why? Well, because there's going to be a, a big rainstorm. How big is the rainstorm going to be? First of all, what's rain? Well, I'll explain it to you later, but, uh, but there's going to be a rainstorm, and it's going to flood the earth. And me and my family and two of every kind of beast and animal on the field are going to get in this ark, and we're going... I still remember Bill Cosby's old skit on Noah. Do you, you remember that? He faced a dubious reputation. When you stand in faith, in faith there are going to be detractors. And it's not pleasant to have your reputation sullied by others who do not walk in your shoes and do not understand your calling. But you may have it when you stand in faith. When it comes to matters of faith, expect that others, even people of faith, will misunderstand you. Expect them to question you, to even pull away from you. Expect that to happen. It's going to happen. But you have to ask yourself the question, will this dissuade me of my faith? Will this cause me to not live by faith? It didn't deter Noah. And for his faithfulness, there was a distinct reward that verse we just read from the Sermon on the Mount about vilifying your faith, it's followed by this verse in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Noah's reward was that his family was saved, as was the planet. All of these things, the challenge of sacrifice and consistency and individuality are all because of, this is the last thing, the challenge of faith. Hebrews eleven six, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Here's what we must understand. Living by faith is all about God's pleasure. We live at God's pleasure. Before Champion Chevrolet and University, uh, GMC Buick Cadillac was bought by Rick Hendricks Motors and named Dale Earnhardt uh, Chevrolet and Dale Earnhardt GMC Buick Cadillac. The, the founder of the company of Champion Chevrolet and University, GMC, was Larry Strom. He's one of the founders, and he was the founder that continued to be with it all the way through. He was one of the founding owners of the company. And when you would call over there, here's what you, you would, you would uh, get the nice greeting by the person that was answering the phone, and then you may be transferred to somebody else and then somebody else. But every time somebody tried to help you with your request. You'd say, uh, I'd like to speak to, uh, there's, there's a guy named Louis LaMarche in the, uh, in the service uh, department, and, and I would always uh, uh, work with Louis, and, and I, would, I would say, I'd like to speak with Louis LaMarche, please. And Larry Strom had every person on the telephone conditioned to say, my pleasure. My pleasure. And when they would say that, you would immediately say in your heart, they're there for me. I understand that. They're there for me. My friend Ron Williams told me about a, a book one time called QBQ, The Question Behind the Question. And much of it is based on that very kind of thing right there, is that people live for the pleasure of someone else. The point of faith is pleasing God. That's the whole point of it. We, we have faith to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So with faith, we can please God. And the reason that we don't want to let our faith rust up is because we want to live as a pleasure to God. When we give our tithes and offerings, it's my pleasure. When we get ready for church and we come to the church service, it's not to pleasure us, it's to be pleasing to God. 
Is it a pleasure to us? I hope that it is. Does it benefit your life? I hope that it does. But when you come and sit in the service on Sunday morning, please be here at the pleasure of God. That's the life of faith, is to live at his pleasure, to live for his pleasure. Not only that, the challenge of faith is is the position that we hold. The text says, for whoever would draw near to God must believe. Well, of course we must believe. We must believe that God exists, but even more than that, we must believe that God lives to reward those who diligently seek him. We have to believe in the God of reward. You have to believe in the God of reward when you don't see the reward. You still believe in the God of reward. Here's the issue that we have oftentimes, is that we we see reward in only one way. And it's not inaccurate, but it's misunderstood sometimes. And that is in prosperity. That's how we want to be rewarded. And I do believe that people of faith will prosper. Joshua made that promise to the children of Israel. In Joshua 1.8, the book of the law, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Here's the thing about reward and prosperity. Just as God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts, His rewards are on his terms and not ours. Faith makes a commitment to wait for the reward until it's given. You remember this illustration from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6 and verse 2. Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The challenge of faith is to obey the Lord and wait for His reward. You say, well, I know somebody, they lived for God all of their lives, and they never did re- uh, get their reward. Yes, they did. See, that's what's wrong with us. We do not understand that life is a vapor. But you said Enoch lived 365 years. He did, and those were vaporous years compared to the weight of eternity of reward. This morning, I want to ask you to meet the challenge of faith and to not let your faith rust up and and to to say god i want to have a long life but i want to have a faith that lives the length of my life as we grow older different parts of us begin to fail a little bit and our shoulders hurt and sometimes our hair falls out and if it doesn't fall out it turns gray and and uh, where our skin gets thinner and we get a little more wrinkled but there's one area of life that can be as young and vibrant as it ever was and that is our faith but we must keep it exercised we must keep the challenge of faith you have been watching the family bible hour a ministry of north florida baptist church in tallahassee florida If you would like a copy of today's message on CD or DVD, write to us at Family Bible Hour, 3000 North Meridian Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32312. Visit us online at nflchurch.com or call us at 850-385-7181. Join us again next time for the Family Bible Hour.